I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'll take a moment. Thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 91 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 091. Hey, I am back and, well, I would say better than ever, but I'm pretty much back where I was before. But the podcast is getting better. Trust me on this. I would like to say the unannounced hiatus was relating to upgrading the podcast, but it's actually the opposite. Upgrading the podcast is going to come because of the unannounced hiatus. I had a number of problems pop up. I had computer problems. I was getting ready for a vacation. I had car trouble while I was going on vacation. My computer problems came back. I successfully went on vacation. Well, kinda. I took the trip but I didn't take as long as I had planned. Anyhow, computer problems. Well, I had a power supply go bad, and being the cheapskate I am, I decided I was going to fix the power supply. And it lasted all of a week before something else failed. And the thing about computer power supplies is once they start failing, uh, you, you're going to either replace everything in them to fix them, or you're going to replace them all together. And it's cheaper to do the latter, especially on one of the higher-end power supplies. Well, my soldering iron... Got a workout. I had the power supply working. It lasted a week. It died. Well, I'll deal with it later. I go on vacation. And I don't know if you've ever taken the interstate from Odessa, Texas to El Paso. But on I-20, there's a town called called Toya. Now, Toya, just before you get to Toya, there's a roadside park on the right. Actually, it's on both sides of the road. And I was about a mile just a hair over a mile. I could see the sign that said roadside park one mile. I was a mile away from that and my pickup decided I was in danger of freezing to death in the 95 degree cold front we were experiencing. So it turned off the AC and built me a fire. Now you may be thinking this cannot be good and it wasn't. I knew something was wrong. I didn't know exactly what at that point because the AC quit blowing cold. I assumed I'd lost a fan belt. But when I went to turn into the roadside park, It steered a little too easy, so I knew something else was going on. I pulled into the roadside park, popped the hood. Fan belt was intact, and part of my brain said, don't worry about that, worry about the fire. The AC compressor had locked up and caught fire. Put the fire out, let it cool down, and limped it all the way home. Well, that ended my vacation plans at that point. It was at this point I sat down, I was going to record an episode, and the power supply in the computer failed after I had fixed it. Since I had to take the pickup and get work done on the AC, because let me just say that it barely made it home, and then it barely made it to Lubbock where I had a service agreement on the pickup to take care of problems like this. Oops, Oops, sorry about that. I almost knocked the microphone out of the boom. However, I get the pickup fixed. I'm on my way home. I thought, you know what? There's a Best Buy right there. I might be able to get a power supply. Dropped in, checked it out. Sure enough, power supply that would work for my application was there. You gotta understand, I have a very unusual application. Bought the power supply, took it home, hooked it up, turned the computer on, everything was good. And then I had to get a bunch of other things done because I was planning to take the time I had originally planned for vacation. I had a few other things that came up, some stuff with work. I can't go into details on that, but let's just say that It has been a hectic time since the last episode. Now, I don't know if you're hearing that. There is some noise in the background. Um, If you do, I apologize. If you don't, well, either it didn't, either it was in the side of the equipment that doesn't do anything to the recording, or I found it and edited it out. Either way, it's good. But you know what? I've talked enough. In fact, I've talked too much about the problems. So I'm going to hit the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about Cleet and their planned assault on open carry and pretty much any other gun rights they can toss into the cart for the next legislative session. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website.
Okay, we're back. And what am I planning here as far as the talk about Cleet? Well, Cleet announced in an article after the Dallas police attacks or their legislative director, or whatever the heck he is, announced that they plan to take action on the open carry law. Now, in the show notes, you'll find a link to the article. And actually, I'm creating the show notes as I go along here. So if I sound a little distracted, that's because I am with I am distracted by actually creating show notes. But anyhow, CLE is a labor union and not a pol- not a police organization. Keep that in mind. And the article I'm linking to does correctly identify them as a union rather than a police organization. CLE is a police union. They're not there to push police political agendas. They're there to push union agendas. Now, in the past, CLE has attacked pro-gun bills that have proven not to increase crime. In fact, these bills have had no effect on crime or crime has fallen, but we can't prove that the bill was actually responsible for the drop in crime because, well, causation does not uh, equal, I mean, well, you know what I'm trying to say. I'm still tired. It's been a very long five days, well, more like a very long eight, nine days. Now, the incidents they cite for a ba- as a basis for attacking open carry actually involve the open carry of long guns. And actually, it's pretty much one incident. You see, they're claiming that the open carry of long guns by Black Lives Matters at the Dallas protest, or maybe, maybe it was the Huey P. Newton Gun Club that was open carrying there, but they were open carrying long guns, and they're claiming that the open carry of these folk, by these folks of long guns somehow led to these police officers being shot, and it didn't. Did it lead to some confusion as to who the suspects were? Maybe. Now, the open carry of long guns has never been illegal in Texas. In fact, our preemption law was watered down on long gun open carry after the new Black Panther Party open carried long guns at the Republican National Convention in Houston. Now, let me make that clear. This was the Republican National Convention in Houston many years ago not the Republican National Convention that we just got passed, because that was not in Houston. As a result of this, we actually saw the preemption law modified so that they could ban the open carry of long guns, say, at political rallies. And guess what? Dallas could have banned the open carry of long guns at that political rally, because that's what that was. But they didn't. And we are seeing somebody actually trying to claim that well, we got to ban open carry altogether because, no. But it's funny. It really is funny. Maybe the, maybe Cleet is assuming that they can, maybe they're buying into the whole propaganda, hype, whatever you want to call it, from the media that Republicans are racist and that they believe if they push that open carry was somehow uh, involved in this murder of police officers by a black man, maybe they think the, that... Republicans in the House and Senate and the state legislature, as well as the governor, will say, well, let's see here. Hmm. You know, cops were killed. Let's pass the law that their union wants. Or maybe the ones that don't do that will say, hmm, black people with guns. Let's pass a law to keep that from happening. Maybe that's what Cleet is hoping for. Maybe they're assuming that Republicans are racist. And I hate to break it to them. If they're assuming that, they're going to be wrong. Now, Let's consider let's consider what this means. Everything that has come through in the last, mm, call it year, everything that has come through in the last year, roughly, on gun laws in Texas, has somehow been associated with open carry. Fines for signs, or as the statute calls it, wrongful exclusion, and we're going to touch on that in just a moment. That particular law is being called, I mean, even the attorney general's office is including uh, open carry in their press releases on the fines for signs law. Think about that. Everything is being linked to open carry that we passed in the last session. You see news articles about campus carry. Half the headlines are saying open carry on campus. Open carry is completely illegal on a college campus. They went so far as to provide both bills with a provision to ban open carry on a campus. The thing is, Clee is hoping that anything they can throw at the open carry wall and stick to it and get 
everything on their open carry wall outlawed will pass. If you're a law enforcement officer, don't think I'm attacking you. Don't think I disapprove of you because I don't. In fact, a lot of the people I know and care about are law enforcement officers. I have had high school kids work where I work that have gone on to become law enforcement officers. Some of them have gone on to the military. I don't have a problem with the military either. However, I do have a problem with CLEAT. CLEAT does not represent the rank and file police officers when it comes to politics. When it comes to politics, they are nothing more than a labor union, and they're trying to they're trying to move the typical liberal labor union agenda forward. But hey, I want to run an audio clip that actually tells you how to find the show on social media. Then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the wrongful exclusion law or fines for signs law, whatever you want to call it, and the attorney general. And then after that, we're going to touch on a couple of other things. And I don't know where I'm going to take breaks on that, but we're taking this break now. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus, And you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Okay, now that we're back from that, let me say that you need to stick around till the end of the podcast. I don't know where I'm going to throw it in, but I am going to make an announcement regarding the upgrades in the podcast, and it may be after the end music. I don't know. It's going to be in here somewhere. After all, I am literally doing this episode as I, I mean, I'm typing up the show notes as I'm doing the episode. I'm winging this one seriously. Okay. Waller County sues Terry Holcomb. We're going to cover that. I've gotten two emails about that since I started the podcast. But we're going to touch on, and it's important that we do this first, we're going to touch on the Texas Attorney General file suit against the city of Austin over unlawful exclusion. In fact, I'm going to save what I just said as a headline. Okay, sorry about that. I'm getting too far into the whole show notes thing. Too distracted. Okay, like many assort, many media sources, and I mentioned this already, the Attorney General's press release has confused all laws passed in the last legislative session as being part of the open carry law. And I'll include a link to the press release, but it's not really a confusion. There's actually a tactical reason he's doing this, I think. I think they did it just so that the press would pick up the article and so that he could kind of telegraph he's going to defend open carry and that he supports it. Now, why would he do that? Well, maybe because of the attack that Cleet is obviously telegraphing that they're going to take and make, or that they're going to make on open carry. That they're going to take on open carry. Oh, God. No, the thing about the lawsuit is, and we've learned a few things, if we'd, and, you know, a lot of people assume that, well, the first, uh, the first day's 1,500, and then every day after is 10,500. Well, maybe not. You see, in the first suit, or fines are $1,500 a day because there's not a violation until the judge rules there's one. So every violation before the judge rules there is one is a first violation. Okay. Subsequent laws will see, or subsequent lawsuits. Oh, I'm typing my show notes up and I'm reading as I type. But anyway, subsequent lawsuits will see the increased penalty. Now, I also suspect that Austin was chosen for a very logical set of reasons. You see, it's extremely likely this case will be appealed despite who wins because this is the city of Austin. And the thing about appeals is they set case law. Now, this case does, speaking of appeals, have a good chance of going to the Texas Supreme Court. Keep that in mind. And it's easier for the Attorney General to fight this case in Austin since, well, the Attorney General's office is in Austin as well. Now, the Attorney General has the option of filing the suit in Austin or in the county where the violation occurs. However... By filing against the city of Austin, he, he's strategically managing to avoid someone saying, well, we need a change of venue because the only venues that are available in this one is Austin. And a city might say, well, we need a change of venue and he needs to come here to sue us. And a judge might actually agree. Well, the law says he can do it in Austin. Yes, 
but you get an activist judge and well, things might not go the way that you want it to go. That's the danger of filing a lawsuit. You have, that's one of the many dangers of filing a lawsuit. Let me put it that way. Now we're going to touch on this next thing, but I want to go ahead and put it here. I'm kind of typing it up as we go. I want to flesh this. I'll actually flesh out these show notes before I post them. But right now it's just kind of a very rough outline. Anyhow, one thing I got uh, sent to me was OCT is claiming that they, Texas Carry and Lone Star Gun Rights, which if you don't know who Lone Star Gun Rights is, I'll touch on that in a moment as well. But anyways, they're saying that these three groups are the only ones filing these complaints as far as groups go. Well, they're kind of right because no other groups are filing these lawsuits. And that's simply because groups don't have to. After this nonsense from Waller County, you might want to get a group to file it for you to insulate you from a retaliatory attack, but we'll see. Now, let's talk about what Lone Star Gun Rights is real quick. You see, Lone Star Gun Rights is the National Association for Gun Rights chapter in Texas. And I'm going to go pull their website up right now. You see, I've had people email me, message me, um... They've left me all kinds of contact information saying, well, we want you to quit uh, messaging us. And my group, you know, I don't have a group. I got a podcast. It's called Gun Rights in Texas. You obviously know that since you're listening. However, what people don't realize is that Lone Star Gun Rights is probably nothing more than a P.O. box. I mean, they have a pretty website. I mean, I won't give them, I won't bash them on that. I mean, it's actually a good looking website. But the thing is, I'm trying to find where it was a while back. But basically, they're just another way for Lone Star Gun, or for National Association for Gun Rights to collect money. That's really all they are. Lone Star Gun Rights has never passed a bill. Lone Star Gun Rights has actually, to my knowledge, they haven't really done anything other than help agitate on House Bill 195. And I could play a big part about you know, what the agitation on that is, but I'm not going to. I mean, I've played the audio clip of Stickland and Phillips, and I've played that many times. I mean, everybody acts like, well, Open Carry Texas passed this bill, if you're a member of Open Carry Texas. Well, they didn't. They did not pass a single piece of legislation. When it comes to Open Carry, they fought House Bill 910 until HB 195 was so far dead that it couldn't even be re- it couldn't even be resurrected in the zombie apocalypse. I mean, that's how dead House Bill 195 was when uh, Open Carry Texas quit pushing it and finally grudgingly started supporting House Bill 910. And by supporting it, I mean they essentially they quit saying, "Well, quit dem-, they essentially quit demanding uh, unlicensed open carry only or unlicensed carry only." I mean, they actually said, we oppose license carry. Uh, contact your senators and tell them such, or something to that effect. Or contact your representatives and tell them such, or something to that effect. Well, guess what? They quit saying that, and they testified at a few hearings, and all of a sudden, yeah, we passed open carry. No, they didn't. Now, Texas Carry was involved in trying to pass open carry. Do they have the political clout to do it? Not really, but they did their best. And for that, I'll give them props because they actually stood up and they stood beside House Bill 910 rather than agitate for House Bill 195. You know, no feet in the door, no uh, body slamming the possibilities of taking a bill off of life support up to the top floor of the hospital and body slamming it from the roof onto the ground. They didn't do that, unlike Corey Watkins and Open Carry Tarrant County. And he was running around with, wait for it, Lone Star gun rights when he did it. But Texas Carry did actually help as far as not agitating. So I give them props. They helped pass open carry in Texas. But they really didn't have much to do with, uh, they really didn't have much to do with the fines for signs law. Lone Star gun rights, on the other hand, Lone Star gun rights has gone from, I mean, they'll claim that they're the largest uh, grassroots organization in Texas. Eh, nope. Sorry, they're not. If I was Open Carry Texas and I was making the same claim, I would not be trying to claim that I'm allied with these folks after they made such a claim, but okay, well, whatever. 
At least I wouldn't be happy about it. Okay, well, if Open Carry Texas, Texas Carry, and Lone Star Gun Rights really didn't help pass the Fines for Signs law, who did? Why, it was a TSRA bill. And the intent was to allow license holders to force local governments to stop wrongfully excluding them. Now, we found a few problems. For example, many counties believe that if they don't mention licenses or license holders, and they don't put up a sign that has 30.6 mentioned in it, then, yeah, they can continue to ban carry. What are they doing? Well, they're posting signs that say, pursuant to Texas Penal Code Section 46.03, this building is off limits to firearms or something to that effect. And that that sign is wrong. It is technically within the word of the law correct. Can somebody make a case that it was not the intent of the legislature and therefore the law can be expanded to cover these signs? I'm certain somebody can. In fact, I'm going to segue here. Terry Holcomb feels the same way. Terry Holcomb is the executive director of Texas Carry. And I want to throw up a link to an article, first thing in the show notes, under the headline, Waller County Sues Terry Holcomb. That's what I had to put down as a headline earlier. Now, Texas Carry claims they've filed 76 complaints so far. And Waller County is one of those 76 complaints. Waller County feels that they're a special cupcake. You see? Apparently, their signs do not mention license holders or 30-06 or licenses or anything like that. It's a 4603 sign. Terry Holcomb feels that, well, this is a violation of the law, and he's pushing for the process to complete to determine yes or no it is or it is not. Well, Waller County does not like this. They're suing Terry Holcomb. What they're suing for is, I believe it's $10,000, and they're suing for a declaratory judgment that their signs do not violate the law. Um, wait a minute. Don't those judgments have to come from the cases that involve the Attorney General's office? Hmm. Are they trying to get an end run around the law? They can take and say, well, here's a here's a ruling on the, this very complaint that says these signs are legal. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get an end run around the law. Now, Texas has a very interesting law that comes into play on this. You see, there's something called a slap lawsuit. A slap lawsuit is a lawsuit designed to keep people from participating in government. Slap stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. Texas has a great anti-slap law. And I'm going to include a link to something that will explain the anti-slap law. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be in the show notes. I've got a space set aside for it. Let me find it, and I'll throw it in there. But basically, some things off the top of my head. When you have somebody being sued for something, and they feel that the anti-slap law comes into play, they can make a motion under the slap law, and as soon as they make this motion, all discovery stops. Essentially, you cannot put somebody in the poorhouse using a law that violates the anti-slap law. You cannot do it with a lawsuit that violates the anti-slap law. In fact, once this uh, provisions uh, or this motion is made, all discovery stops, and it and whoever makes the motion, which is usually the defendant, it can be in a counter. It can be used against the counterclaim too. So, um, so not necessarily the defendant has to be the one to do it, but it's rare that anyone other than the defendant does it. But once the anti-slap provision is or motion is made, it's up to whoever makes the motion to prove their case. Yes, this is a slap suit, and this is why. And guess what? It should be easy to prove that, yeah, this is a slap. This lawsuit is a slap suit. And then all burden of proof for proving that, yes, there is a, there is a reason that this needs to proceed falls on to whoever the motion was made against. When when or if they cannot prove that such is the case, they suddenly become liable for all of the uh, person that made the motion's uh, legal expenses relating to the slap violation. Also, whatever the slap uh, motion was made against is immediately thrown out. Now, if a slap motion is denied, there is a uh, there is a provision so that you have an expedited appeals process for that motion too. You can really abuse the anti-slap law in Texas. 
And because of that, some attorneys may be hesitant to use it because when you abuse uh, certain provisions, you actually face uh, sanctions. So some attorneys may be hesitant to use the anti slap law. But what's interesting is the Waller County District Attorney is not a very, well, let's just say he has a bit of a history. You see, Waller County is also the county where Sarah Bland died while she was in custody, and it was Mathis who investigated whether or not uh, anything untoward happened, and he said she had some mental issues and nothing was wrong. Now, I'm certain the Texas Rangers probably investigated as well, and I don't know anything about what their findings were or if they've even uh, released findings because maybe they're still investigating. Also, going back even further, Waller County District Attorney Mathis he also reportedly, and I use that term very loosely, he actually admitted that he sent the text, but it's reported that he threatened a pastor. Now, the pastor accused Mathis of racial bias in his prosecution of cases, and apparently he, Mathis and this pastor were messaging each other via text messaging, and uh, Mathis said some things that could be taken as a threat, and Mathis admitted to sending the, uh, those messages and claims he was just and I'm putting just in quotes because, yeah, he was just attacking the pastor's character. Yeah, that that's a really nice guy right there. Somebody's calling you out on something and you're going to attack their character? I don't care who you are. If you're a public official and you're attacking their character, you don't do it via text. You do it face-to-face. -face. But hey, I'm going to... Well, you do it like, you know, you do it in the media. You don't just... Okay, I'm attacking your character. It's only going to be me and you. No, that's a threat. I mean, that can easily be considered a threat. If you do it face-to-face, -face, you do it in the media, then it's a character attack. If you're doing it, uh, and you got to make sure there's witnesses for it to be a character attack, really. Otherwise, you're just trying to stir the pot or you're making threats. I don't even know the content of the messages. I've read something about uh his he was releasing his hounds or something like that and the pastor said well hounds are used for hunting so uh he's wanting to hunt me and yada yada but i don't know if that's the case or not it may have been a threat but it may not have been a death threat it may have been a threat well you keep doing this and i'll dig into your past and and uh and at this point it might have been it might not have been a it might have been a threat for blackmail maybe but hey i'm rambling let me tell you how to get in touch with me on email. We'll come back and we'll talk about the battle lines coming up for the next legislative session. And then I'll either talk about the changes coming to the podcast or I'll end the show and talk about them after the show. It's going to have to fit in one of those two places. So here we go. Here's how you get in touch with me via audio clip. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Now, a lot of this I've already touched on. But we're going to talk about, and I'm going to, you know, in the headline for this section, it's going to be interesting notes on the battle line. But as I said, the Attorney General's office, and I may not have said it in this way, but I've, I've kind of hinted at it. The Attorney General's office has clearly telegraphed their position on open carry in their press release for their suit against the city of Austin. Essentially, the Attorney General will defend the open carry law. Now, the TSRA's position is clear because they fought tooth and nail to get this law passed. They fought against gun banners. They fought against uh, organizations saying, oppose license carry, unlicensed only, yada, yada. Have, call your representative. Tell them you oppose license carry and that they need to support House Bill 195 instead. Well, they fought against all that. And I guarantee you, they're not going to just simply say, well, you know, we fought to get this passed, but it's too controversial, so take it away. No, they're not going to do that. Lead is obviously planning to move against open carry and they'll probably go against any pro gun law they can get to stick to that open carry wall as well and they have but when it comes to the legislature they will also attempt to claim that open carry was in part responsible for the deaths of five dallas police officers killed at the black lives matter protest 
The problem with that is open carry was not to blame. Now, Bloomberg's minions, and they're probably, I want to I definitely put this in the show notes. They're probably all the one-eyed type because there's obviously no depth percep- perce- perception, but they are taking their obvious position as well. Other things we can expect on with all the fighting that the attorney general's having uh, to do on the fines for signs law, also known as the wrongful exclusion law, you can expect there to be an effort to move against that law as well. We can also expect attacks on campus carry, and that may be rolled into attacks on open carry as well. After all, they seem to have both of those laws confused as being one and the same. And you can expect to see attacks on preemption to weaken open carry and other gun rights because, well, that's what they do. They try to weaken any gun right that they can. If you have a wall that is impenetrable to your forces right now, but you can sit there and you can chip away at its foundation, eventually you can weaken it enough that you can punch through it. And when you punch through it, you can tear it down. Think of it like a dam. As long as that dam doesn't leak, it's okay. The moment you have a leak, you need to get that sucker patched and you need to get it patched now. Or it can fail. And it will not fail just piecemeal. It will fail catastrophically. And that's the thing about gun rights. They're trying to chip away at it and we're trying to patch the damage that they've done. But once it springs a leak, well, good luck stopping it. Because if we don't stop it, we've lost. But what can you do to stop the damage? What can you do to prevent further damage? Well, first off, you can join or donate with the NRA. NRA has a Texas legislative uh, representative, or they have a they have someone that comes in and they represent Texas in the legislature. Now, she does have a few other states she has to represent, so she doesn't spend all of her time in Texas. But she, from everybody tells me she's a nice lady. I've never spoken to her, but her name's Tara Micah, and I'm told she's a great lady, but she cannot spend all of her time in Texas because she's got at least two other states she has to cover. So while she's dealing with Texas, she's also jumping over, I think, into Louisiana, and I forget the other state. So to give yourself coverage where she can't be, you also need to join and donate with the TSRA. TSRA is the state affiliate of the NRA, and the TSRA concentrates solely on Texas, but there's more. It doesn't stop there. You can join and donate with the Texas Firearms Coalition. Now, this is Charles Cotton's group, and, I mean, he doesn't have the political capital that the NRA does, obviously. I mean, he's a member of the board of directors, but he doesn't have all of their political capital. He doesn't have the political capital of the TSRA, but he does have political capital. He's got experience. And if you join and donate to the Texas Firearms Coalition, you're increasing the political capital he has at his disposal. And I strongly recommend it. Okay? You can also call, write, or fax your local and area and regional and whatever representatives that are elected. And you can let them know what your position is. Now, some may have already got their re-election locked in, and these are the ones that you need to start hitting now. And you may be saying, well, we haven't had the general election yet. All we've had are primaries. Many races in Texas are won and lost in the primary simply because this particular candidate does not have an opponent in the other party. So, once they win their primary, yes, technically they're on the ballot for the general election, but they're the only one on the ballot. So they've already won their, they've already won their uh, re-election. Now, if they do have an opponent in the general election, make sure that they and their op- and their opponent know your position. You can also, and this is very important too, you can go listen to Charles Cotton's Texas Firearms Coalition podcast, and I am including the link to them as well as well as the NRA, TSRA, and Texas Firearms Coalition. In fact, this is really two links to the Texas Firearms Coalition because the podcast page is on the Texas Firearms Coalition website as well. But go listen to the TFC podcast. Like I said, it's on the Texas Firearms Coalition website. And finally, join the Texas LTC or CHL forum website. The domain would be texasltcforum.com or texasclforum.com. They both work. I'm trying to use Texas LTC Forum when I go to the website, but out of habit, I keep typing Texas CHL Forum because I've typed that for so many years. And the banner at the top still says Texas CHL Forum. When I finally start typing LTC more often than CHL, then I will know that, well, I did it. I have finally got past the ingrained, it's a CHL, 
and I've and I'm starting to call it an LTC. But until the day I die, it'll probably be called an LTC in my uh, in my mind. Okay, let's run the audio that ends the podcast, and then I'll come back and I'll tell you what I'm going to do to quote unquote upgrade the podcast. So here's the sign off music, and then I'll after after that I'll be back. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Okay, I am making changes to the podcast. When and how these changes are going to come into play, I'm not 100% sure. But episodes like you're listening to now and you've listened to in the past, those are going to be called single action episodes. Why? Because they're slower, they're out, they're not out as often, but they have the contents loaded with a little bit more. It just reminds me of a big old single action revolver with a six or longer inch barrel. Now I know, Bach people are like, "Well, why are you uh, why are you on your single action kick?" Well, you're not left out in the dark. No, I'm not calling them Glock episodes. I'm about to start a whole new branch of the podcast. It's going to be in the same feed. Everything's going to be the same. There will be separate feeds where you can get just one or the other, but only the main feed will be going to iTunes. And I don't know when I'll get both of these feeds created, but we'll see. Now, the new episodes are going to be out more frequently. They're going to be very rough. They're not going to be even remotely as clean as this one. And this one's not exactly a clean episode, as you can tell, as far as audio quality. However, let's talk a little bit about what's going to happen with them. They may be recorded in my vehicle as I'm driving down the road. They may be recorded on my cell phone. They may be recorded on my iPad. I may have the iPad and the Zoom H6 in the same vehicle and connected where I can do the audio for the intro and the sign off, which will be the only audio you get that might be included. And because there's going to be so many of them, they're going to be called the high capacity episodes or high caps. When you have a high cap episode, like if it's high cap episode number one, it'll be HC one, you know, it'll be gun rights in Texas.com slash HC one. If it's number 150, it'll be gunrightsintexas.com slash hc150. That's how you'll find it on find the show notes if you want to see them. Show notes will be very bland. It may be a link. It may just be, I ramble about this. But I guarantee you, if the show notes are more than a paragraph on a high cap episode, something's wrong. They're going to be short. They're going to be small. And they're going to, you'll be able to fit, you'll be able to fit a lot in a magazine. Wait, there's a magazine? Why, yes, the magazine would be your audio player of choice. Okay. There's enough of that. You may be thinking, well, if you're not going to include any of the audio clips, how are people going to know how to get in touch with you? Get the show. At some point I'll throw out the podcast website and I'll throw, and that'll be with the show notes or when I meant to tell you how to get the show notes, that'll be how you find the podcast website. And then we'll uh, throw out there that somewhere in the show, I'll throw out an email address where people can email me. It'll be that simple, that easy. And that'll be it. Now, these episodes, they won't be on a regular basis, but they could, I could easily have more than one episode a day. I could have an episode a day for a while, and it may go a week between them. As a result of going to the high cap episodes, I'm going to cover more news. And these will be news items I'm basically covering, like the whole thing with Waller County and Terry Holcomb. That would be a good thing to have a high cap episode. And I thought about doing that to introduce them. But I'm not 100% ready to launch the high cap episodes right now. I may launch them, say, in two or three days. I may launch them in a couple of hours after I've had the opportunity to test a few things. Now I said, you know, they'll have, they might have the intro and sign off music. They might not. It may just be, hey, you're listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. This is high capacity episode number XYZ. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash hcxyz. And then there's the episode or the show notes. 
these will be something that I can I can edit. Uh, and by edit, I'm going to be I'm using that term very loosely. They may not have any information embedded in them as far as the when they're converted to MP3. They may not have any of the ID3 tags embedded. These may be just simply thrown together, thrown on the uh, they're thrown on the server and show notes thrown up. Everything released, and there you go. Who knows? But you know what? I've rambled long enough, and I'm going to end this with uh, stay safe, carry responsibly, and, well, be active. Defend your rights. Don't, don't sit back and do nothing. Join the NRA. Join the TSRA. Join the Texas Firearms Coalition. Listen to Charles Cotton's Texas Firearms Coalition podcast. When something happens in the political arena, he will probably get it out before anyone else. And that's something to keep in mind. But stay safe and carry responsibly.